spiritual war words and wonders. Man, the unseen. Hello, Porch. How you doing, man? It is awesome to be with you. I wanted to jump in on this series because I love you guys. And because this truth that we're talking about right here is going to make the difference between death and life for you. And it's also one of the areas that is most misunderstood, which doesn't surprise me. If we've got an enemy and he is at war with us, one of the greatest things that he can do is to convince you that he's something that he's not or that he attacks you in ways that he doesn't. Because if you believe he's something that he's not, man, it's hard to resist what you believe doesn't exist. And it's also hard to fight against an enemy when you think the enemy's fighting this way when he's really fighting that way. And I'm telling you something, there is a fight and you are to be of sober spirit, which means don't be drunk on bad theology, on bad teaching, on imaginary ideas, it means you be sober, you be clear thinking, you be on the alert because you have an adversary, the devil. Do you guys know this? 60% of Christians don't believe in the devil. They think of him as some kind of just idea or some uh, abstract representation. In fact, what's so even crazier is almost that many believers think that the Holy Spirit is not a person, it's an it. They're more informed by Star Wars theology, this impersonal force that you activate more than understanding that God is a living being. And when you don't understand the power of God and you understand the threat of your enemy, man, you are cooked. And you're going to start to look like the way people stereotypically say your generation looks. And I love you guys. And truth sets you free. There's an enemy. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He is stealing your future. He is killing your hope. He is destroying your self-respect. He's destroying your relationships. He's destroying family before your eyes. Over 50% of all children born to your generation are born into single family households. Why? Because you've bought a lie. And I love you guys, and we're going to give you some truth, all right? And it's going to set you free, man. Truth is always compassionate when you share it because it sets people free. But truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth, right? And so when you speak the truth, you do it in love because truth said in hate won't be heard. But love without truth is not love, folks. And your generation has... Too few truth tellers in it, which is why I love the porch, because you guys get some truth here. Amen? There's some truth. Now, listen, you might be there like, okay, well, let's just hear what kind of truth you got. Let me give you some truth, okay? One of the things that um, I, I loved to do when I was a kid is we would, we would share ghost stories, right? Because I kind of love the feeling of being scared. When I was a kid, I didn't know any better, right? And so I loved getting scared. And we would tell stories, and we would get freaked out, and um, we would go see movies. I mean, back then, the, the Night of the Living Dead, the very first zombie movie, it was first a black and white film. I can remember watching that at a drive-in before I hit puberty. And it freaked me out, man. That's all I can tell you. And it should have. Because you're not supposed to sit there and have your mind meditate on that kind of craziness and that kind of evil. But if you think about classic horror films, if you think about the movie that, um, that said it all, on fire that really got it on, gone on, it was a movie that starred this guy, right there, Frankenstein. That's what got it all going. Now listen, here's the deal. You guys know this, <laughs> not because you're scholars, not because you did your homework when you were in high school, but because there's a movie that come out recently, and you probably know who wrote Frankenstein, right? Because you've, you, you now know that there's Bram Stoker's Dracula, and there is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? Because you, you, you read the spark notes to a book, right? Remember? <laughs> yeah, you did. So let me tell you about Mary Shelley, because here's the thing. What you need to know is that the horror genre really came out of the sexual revolution. What? Watch this. Here's the real monster. Check out this good-looking cat. This brother, if he was at the porch, right here, not, not him, this guy. <laughs> All right, if that other brother's at the porch too, tell him, get on out of here, old man. All right, this ain't for you. But that guy, that is the real monster. That good looking cat right there is Percy Shelley. Percy Shelley was a romantic poet who was part of the Enlightened movement. Percy Shelley had an affair with one. 
little girl named Mary who gallivanted with him all over Europe. Percy Shelley remained married and had an affair with Mary. Um, and as they traveled around more and more, more despairing became Percy's wife until ultimately she killed herself. This romantic poet betrayed the love of his life, taught about enlightenment and rationalism and finding hope in the human way, a way that seems right to man, but in the end leads to death. And it led to the death of his first wife. And it led to the terrorization of his second wife, whom he married, one Mary Shelley, who he encouraged to have an open marriage, to have sex with his friends. Let me just tell you the story of Frankenstein in case you forgot it. Brick to Frankenstein, the book starts with a guy sailing up towards Antarctica and they find this guy in Antarctica roaming and they bring him on the boat and he's almost dead. His name is Victor Frankenstein. And Frankenstein goes on to tell Robert Walton, the man who was on this expedition to the North Pole, his story. He says that, that he left his family, he became isolated and he sought for truth in isolation apart from any other revelation or any other moral compass, Victor Frankenstein sought to educate himself and find more. Now remember who's writing this, who's writing this? Percy Shelley's adulterous relationship wife. And there is a guy that tells his rescuer, Robert Walton, that he has figured out a way to bestow animation upon lifeless manner. In other words, he has learned to create life on his own terms apart from God. That's what Victor Frankenstein has done. If you follow the story of Victor Frankenstein, you see that his experiment goes horribly wrong because the monster that he creates he was not pleased with the way that he looked. In other words, the life that he got when he created life apart from God was a life that to him even became ugly. And so the monster was cast out. If you remember the story, he roamed around and he saw a family led by a blind man. It was a compassionate man who taught his children to read and Frankenstein would peer through the window and learn to read and learn how human relationships work by watching this compassionate blind man who didn't see the way others see but saw something else, real beauty in individuals. And Frankenstein eventually had the courage one day to go in and talk to this man because the man was blind. He didn't see the ugliness of the life that was created and he loved Frankenstein but then this man's children came home, saw him and beat him and he ran away. The monster did, and he was angry. And so watch what happens. I don't have time to go into the whole story, but bottom line, what starts to happen is Victor Frankenstein's buddy is, is actually his younger brother destroyed by the life that he created. His best friend destroyed by the life that he created. His father, seeing the horror that had come to his family through the life that his son had created, died in grief. Are you seeing a theme here? And the monster found Victor Frankenstein and said, I'm not gonna kill you right now, but I know you love this dear woman and on your wedding night, I will haunt you. You think what you do and what you create and the truth that you believe won't haunt you on your wedding night? You think the sexual revolution that you celebrate, Percy Shelley, won't haunt you on your wedding night? Mary Shelley is writing a story about what happens when men in an enlightened state says this is the beautiful life. No, it's a monster and it destroys your family, it destroys your friends, it destroys your wedding. You think I'm crazy? Let me just tell you something else. Uh, I already, I, I, you knew because they titled the movie Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I, I said it myself, but say it again. Who wrote Dracula? Bram, Bram Stoker's Dracula. You know what Dracula is? Same guy, came right out of the exact same enlightenment. During the enlightenment, Men were adulterous and believed that they should find their satisfaction in what made sense to man. And so what happened is that during the Enlightenment, all of a sudden there was an infection that came in the blood of men. Syphilis ran through them. And there were innocent women who had through blood transmission and bodily fluid transmission, that infection transmitted to them. Dracula, what is it? It's a novel about a vampire who infects the blood of innocent girls. Bram Stoker had syphilis. Let me tell you guys something, all right? When you try and find life apart from God, when you, like Victor Frankenstein, bestow animation upon a lifeless matter, in other words, when you try and make life exist where life doesn't exist, it always leads to death. 
There is no other life except for the life that God gives you and he loves you and so he's calling you into a relationship with him. Mary Shelley wrote an amazing book that you ought to go back and read because I know you didn't read it in high school. You ought to go back and read the book and you ought to read it through the lens of the girl who wrote it. When men lead in a way that seems right to men, it ruins my life. This woman was sexually tormented. And she said, your monster has ruined my life. It killed your first wife. And it showed up on our wedding night and it's killing me. Man, there is an enemy and you ought to know him and you ought to be on the alert and it is a hard story. Let me tell you something, man. If you don't believe there is an enemy that is out there, you won't resist him. You can't resist what you don't believe exists. And when you're not sober and on the alert because you don't know that there's an adversary who wants to destroy you or when you think you need to fight him in a way that you shouldn't fight him because you've bought into some myth, you're gonna get your clock cleaned. So we're gonna give you some truth tonight. I'm gonna give you seven truths to defeat the liar. Are you ready? Let's go. Number one, there is no secret about what's coming or who it's coming from. Now, this is really important. The very first thing I'm gonna tell you is that what's coming is a lie. I, I, you guys um, don't probably sing a lot of hymns anymore. That's okay. We sing different kinds of hymns. We sing beautiful music that focuses on the goodness of God. And, and we learn about God's character and nature. There was a guy, you're gonna hear more about him because 500 years ago, this October, we're gonna celebrate what he did where he posted uh, his thesis on a door uh, in, in 1517. Is that right? No, let's go back in 500 minus, yeah, that's right, 1517 in Wittenberg, all right? Uh, he put his 95 thesis up there. And that 95 thesis was 95 things wrong with the way men are representing God on earth, Martin Luther. Martin Luther wrote a song called A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. And uh, in that song, he talks about our enemy, the devil. And he says in there, one single word shall fell him. You know what the single word is that shall fell the enemy? It's not be gone, because that's two words, all right? It's liar. Liar. That's the word Luther had in mind. Because Luther knew it's the truth that will set you free. Let me just tell you something. If you think your interaction with the enemy is a power encounter, you're gonna look to bring power to bear. It's not a power encounter. It is a truth encounter. This is so significant, okay? This is the thing you gotta understand. There should be no surprise about what's coming or who it's coming from. What's coming is a lie. He is a liar, he's been that way from the beginning. John chapter eight, verse 44. You, he says, to false religious teachers, some of whom today exist and teach you the wrong way to do war against the enemy. Jesus is saying to these guys, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies, which means whenever somebody starts to tell you something about this is where life can be found, whether it's with a poem and a rose, or sweet seduction or a soft caress, what you wanna do is ask, is this action being informed by the author of love and the God who cares for me and withholds no good things from those who love him? If you cannot trace back what this individual is doing to the word of God, you can be sure he is selling a lie. And if you follow it, you're gonna find what Mary Shelley found, that that man who says he loves you, that romantic poet who is sweeping you down a current of a relationship is going to be a monster and it will destroy you. What is coming is a lie. God isn't good, his word's not true, disobeying him is not that big a deal, go back. He shows up in your Bible in Genesis three and that's what he does. He challenges the truth of God's word, he challenges your knowledge of it and you're vulnerable to him if you don't know what truth is. He, he challenges the idea of judgment, he challenges the idea that God cares about you because he is a liar. What is coming? What is coming from him is temptation. And it's coming to your flesh, which because you are a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve, your flesh is corrupted, which means we're all born with a sin nature. Now, this is really important. We live in a fallen world that is inhabited by a deceiver and our flesh is corrupted. Let me say that again. We live in a fallen world 
that is run and that is inhabited by a deceiver underneath God's sovereignty. God gave Satan the ability to um, be present on earth, but he gave us the ability to have dominion over the earth. He is the prince of this world, but we serve the king of all creation. And so as servants of that king, we don't have to listen to some little local prince. He says, if you do, then you will live on this world that I wanted you to be a vice regent on, a son of the king, you will live in bondage to him and it will not go well with you. So don't buy his lies. We've bought his lies and we have handed down one generation to another a corrupt soul, a sin nature. Now watch this. In this world inhabited by a deceiver with our corrupt flesh, which we inherited from our father and mother, and we have well established for the next generation to inherit from us, in a world that is broken and runs according to this prince and rebels against God, we are told, hey, you're going to be tempted. Now this is James writing to the church, so check this out. He says this in James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God himself cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself doesn't tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when the scripture says he is carried away and is enticed by his own fallen nature, his own desire to find life apart from God, his own desire to bestow animation, to give life where life was not spoken to exist by God. And when we in our arrogance and belief that we don't need God, we can do it on our own, when we go over here and we're carried away by that lust to have what we want our way and our time, it always brings forth death. Just like Victor Frankenstein's invention. It says right here, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. What do you see right here? Watch, this is really important. Let me walk you through very carefully what it says. It, it, it tells you here, be careful, okay, when you're being tempted and enticed by your own lust. Notice it doesn't say when you're being enticed by, and this is, this is key, there's no surprise about what's coming or who it's coming from. It doesn't say when you are tempted by the demon of lust. It says when you're tempted by your own fallen nature. Temptation and evil is monolithic. You're like, oh man, that's awesome. That's a great thing. Write that down. What's monolithic mean? All right, let me tell you. This is what monolithic means. When something is monolithic, um, it means it is one. It is, um, it is one stone, one piece. There is no division in it, okay? Um, there is never any differentiation or distinction in the scripture about what we're doing battle against, whether it's the prince of darkness, the adversary, the liar, the deceiver, the world that has been deceived by him, or the flesh that has been corrupted by him. This is huge. James is telling you, this is your problem when you're tempted and you're carried away, James says, by your own lust. He could have said by the prince of deception. He could have said by the course of the ways of the world. Why? Because Paul later wrote to you and he says this in Ephesians chapter two, verse one. He says, listen, this is what you used to be before you were a Christian that James wrote to. He said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now watch, in which you formerly walked according to, watch these three things, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedient. All three of those things, it's the monolithic, it's if you will called the trinity of evil, the axis of evil. What Italy and Japan and Germany were during World War II, that's what the world, the course, the current of this world, lower Greenville, all right? Um, Stick that in your Houston context, all right, or your Fort Worth context. Um, you know, just that life is found apart from God. Life, if it feels right, do it. The course of this world, what your flesh thinks and what the enemy sells. There is never a distinction. This is huge. There's never a different, differentiation or distinction in doing battle against any of those three. This is going to matter big time when you think about how to go to war against it. Because you can't cast out your flesh. You don't have, you're not gonna be somebody that says, oh, I, I, I rebuke the whole world. The world goes, oh, you're right. We'll no longer have a Macy's Day parade that celebrates sin. No, that's what the world does all the time. It's always parading towards this 
life against God. The enemy's always going to lie and he's always going to be roaming about seeking someone to devour. And catch this, your flesh is always going to want what it wants. Don't be surprised that even after you know that God is good and he loves you and he's died for you, that your flesh still wants to sin. When it says in the scripture, if any man is in Christ, therefore, if any man is in Christ, uh, he is a new creation. Behold, old things are gone, new things have come. I gotta tell you, I can remember when I trusted Christ, I, I couldn't believe that I still found myself lusting in my flesh. I couldn't believe I still found myself wanting to spike in anger in my flesh. I couldn't believe I was still attracted to all the things that I was attracted to before. And I go, I thought I was supposed to be a new creature. I thought I was never gonna wanna be you know, uh, prideful or self-absorbed again. I thought I was never gonna wanna objectify women again. I thought I was never gonna be a slave to pornography again. And it, it, I, I, I meant to, I prayed to receive Christ five or six times in the first 48 hours. Because it must not have taken. Because the old wasn't gone. Yes, it was. Here's the thing. Let me explain that verse to you. What had changed was my understanding about God. Before I saw the beauty of God and his kindness towards me, that he wasn't mad, that he wasn't looking for me to build a resume and do my own works and, 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 and become good enough long enough that God would maybe one day accept me. I saw God as a, as a, as a policeman that was there waiting to blow his whistle and you know, knock me over the head with his little uh, you know, baton or principal or a teacher that was gonna go, hey, caught you, go down to that office or a referee that was gonna throw a flag on me or, or, or some high standard I could never meet. And so I really didn't want a relationship with God. I just didn't wanna be busted by him. And then all of a sudden I saw the beauty of God. I saw that he loves guys like me. He wanted to rescue me, not give me a bunch of rules. The rules were there to show me what his holiness looked like and, then, and to show me that I wasn't that guy. And so I would cry out for mercy. And when I asked for mercy, because he's a loving God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and compassion, he would give me that mercy. And all of a sudden I go, that's who God is. And he's not mad at me. He wants to reparent me and retrain me. He wants to give me the freedom to not listen to my flesh or the deceiver that has corrupted my flesh or the world that is identified by a bunch of fleshes like I had. What had changed was my understanding of God. And I no longer thought the spirit of this age was the spirit to follow. The spirit of my flesh was the spirit to follow. I now was no longer under bondage to an unholy spirit. I knew the truth about the Holy Spirit. And so I would listen to him. And prior to that, I never would listen to him. So let me just start by just making it very clear right here that there is no secret about what is coming or who it's coming from. What is coming is a lie. It's not a power encounter. It's not a demon of lust. It's just lust. Humans thinking that on their own, they can create animation in a lifeless matter. I can make sex something that God never intended it to be, and it can still be life-giving. See, God loves sex. God loves even drugs. You know that? Everything is lawful, and everything is good when it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer, the scripture says. This idea that sex is bad, don't mess with it, drugs are bad, no, drugs are a gift. Ask my wife who's delivered six children, okay? They, that little epidural, I mean, you know, she'd take her wedding ring off and put it right around that needle if she could. Like, I love you, come here, all right? So when you use drugs correctly, not to, not to pull you out of reality, but when you use drugs directly to help, help the sick and the hurting and to, and to minimize and to, and, and, uh, pain so we can excise that which is evil in your body and killing you, okay, it works. It's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. God's given us all these things. You guys know that all drugs are basically derivative of plants that he's given us the knowledge to understand how to break down, how to use. But some of us use those plants to escape reality, not be victorious in it. Is that glorious at all? I go, man, life's too hard for me. I just smoke some weed and chill. Well, that leaves the women and children in an awesome place. Way to go, man. Just tap out. Just go take a trip while the rest of the world lives in sadness. And by the way, all you become is a bigger burden into the world. And God's just saying, I can teach you to be a man and go to war against the world. But you've got to be sober. Think clearly. Number one, there is no... <laughs> secret, right? There is no secret about what's coming or who it's coming from. Number two, are you ready? 
I hate that I'm a white American male who only gets to teach for 40 minutes. I need to go to Africa where they teach half a day, eat lunch, and come back and finish the message. That's where I want to go. All right, here we go. But the floodwaters are rising in Houston, so we must hurry. Here we go. There is, there is no shame, okay? Number two, there is no shame or sin in being tempted. There is no shame or sin in being tempted. It's a lie, okay? Let me just show you something that's amazing, right? We are saved because we have a sinless Savior who went to a cross for us, and God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Though he was rich, he became poor, so that in his poverty we might become rich. Why do I share those verses? Because that guy who was sinless, who was rich in perfection, was tempted. What's that tell you? Temptation is not sin. Luke chapter four talks about Jesus. Watch this. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. That, listen, I would love if everybody started a sentence, Todd the other day, full of the Holy Spirit. I don't really care what comes after that. <laughs> All right? I would love that to be the case. It was always the case with Jesus. He's the perfect man, not because... Um, of any other reason than he always yielded to the will of God. And he said no to lies. And he loved the truth. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. One of the things that really just concerns me and scares me is the way certain people think if they're really spiritual, they wouldn't be tempted. And, and I want to let you know that that is not the mark, okay, of a godly individual. If you don't admit, if you can't admit you are vulnerable, you're never going to seek protection and encouragement. One of the things that you have to do is acknowledge, listen, I'm seriously tempted by this. I tell my friends, look, you guys know enough Greek mythology to know about this concept called the Achilles heel. And what typically happens if, you know, guys, as they start to get my age, and they go out and they run like they used to run without stretching and being careful, their body eventually gives in and their Achilles pops and it's awful. It's a, it's a place of weakness in man. And if you don't tell other people, this is where I'm weak, this is where I'm getting attacked, this is where the enemy can take me out. If you don't tell others where that is, how can they encourage you and help you? This is what the scripture says. It says we should encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of us would be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's Hebrews chapter three, verse 13. And I would just encourage you with this. There is no shame. It is not sin to be tempted. Remember what it said back there in James chapter one? Each one is tempted when he's carried away by his own lust. And that lust then is, gives birth to sin. But the temptation itself is not the problem. It's that your flesh doesn't go lie, lie, right? Or actually your flesh will never say lie. Your flesh will say, give me that, give me that, give me that. But you do not need to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what's new. God is good. His way is true. All his ways are peace. In his right hand is fullness of joy and his left hand are pleasures forever. Why would I go there? I'm not gonna lean on my own understanding, but in all my ways, I'm gonna acknowledge him and he'll make my path straight. But there is nothing wrong with saying, look, man, I'm tempted by same-sex attraction. I'm tempted by fear of men. I'm tempted by pornography. I'm tempted to escape the world and smoke weed. I'm tempted to hit Adderall. I'm tempted to excessively diet. I'm tempted to believe that I'll be happy if I make life pleasant because I'm more comfortable than others because I'm rich. There's nothing wrong with saying that. In fact, it's helpful so people can come around you and help you with truth. There is no sin in being tempted. Number three, there is no such thing as a faithful man who surrenders to temptation. Proverbs says this, it says, many a man proclaims his loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? There is no such thing as a godly man or a faithful man or a godly woman or a faithful woman who surrenders to temptation. Now watch, this is important. Notice I did not say there is no such thing as a godly man who doesn't sin. 
And there's a significant difference. This is one of the issues that I am zealous for my friends with same-sex attraction to hear. Because for too long, for too long, guys who were communicating in positions like mine acted like the temptation towards the same sex was an offense to God, and until you could no longer be tempted towards men, you would never be a godly person. Can I just tell you something? You might be a person who, maybe even as long as you can remember, that's what your flesh was drawn to, guy or girl. And when you trust Christ, I'm not here to tell you that all of a sudden you're no longer going to have same-sex attraction. In the same way that just because I've walked with Jesus for 30 years and had a ring in my hand for 26, 27 years, that I'm not attracted to other women. But what happens is I don't surrender to that which seems right to me. I don't lean on my own understanding. But in all my ways, I acknowledge him and he'll make my paths straight. But for me to have to act like I'm no longer sorely tempted or seriously tempted by something else is, is crazy. And, and for somebody else to say, I'm just gonna surrender to that and Jesus is okay with that, I'm gonna go, no, no. What fellowship does darkness have with light? How can you say I'm going to do what God said is unholy and the Holy Spirit is okay with that? But it is crazy, okay? I mean, listen, I, I'm gonna just drop a couple of these in here. You know, um, I, I do something every now and then to kind of give stuff to you in a shorter way, since sometimes my first point at last 18 minutes, I, I sometimes, I do stuff called Real Truth Real Quick, and, and I did one on gay reparative therapy or conversion therapy. And what's a, what's a biblical view of that? And I want you to go listen to it. I want you to be informed about what your gay friends are going through. And they're not gay if they're followers of Christ. They're sinners who struggle with same-sex attraction. They're not gay. In the same way, I'm not a lech and an adulterer. I'm tempted towards that. That's not who I am. We don't ever identify ourselves by our sexual desires, sexual accomplishments, or sexual escapades. We identify ourselves by the love of God. And we acknowledge that our flesh may still go a certain direction. Let me say this to you. Number three, this is very important. There's no such thing as a faithful man, a person who's serious about following God, who surrenders to that which is contrary to the word of God. A lie. Fourthly, there is no saint who is beyond falling or screwing up. Um, I have a gentleman that I had the privilege of meeting one time. His name is Michael Cromartie. He just died. He was a, a godly man who lived um, in D.C. and he worked in the quarters of power and um, was a great blessing to our nation. No one really even knew Michael Cromartie, but he was an amazing man. And, um, and one of the things I heard him say one time that I frankly, you know, I'm asked a lot when people ask me about men that fall, they say things like, Todd, are you shocked by that? And, and Cromartie said this, and I've used it like it's mine, and I said this, I'm never surprised by weakness or sin. I'm just not. You know what I'm surprised by? I'm surprised by virtue. I'm surprised by godly character, because I, I, I just, in this world that is run by a liar, where every piece of flesh in it is longing to rebel against God and the course of this world is to draw our flesh away from God, I'm always surprised when I see people by the grace of God and the power of God, through the knowledge of God and the grace that works in men, see people resist sin and live holy, virtuous lives. Can I guys tell you guys something? I run scared, man. I, I am so aware of the fact that I could, I could be next I'm so aware that, that I could do things that, that would dishonor my God, that would, that, would, that would be a death to my bride, that would kill my closest friends, that would grieve my father, and that would terrorize my community. That I pay attention to the word of God. I meditate on it day and night so I might be careful to do according to all that is written. And let me just say this, man, be afraid, be very afraid. Billy Graham, that we all love and is, is, is soon coming to the end of his life. We love Billy Graham because he's one of the few guys that we think wasn't corrupted in the way that so many other guys are corrupted when they become celebrated as spiritual men. Billy Graham was always a guy that said, man, Billy, what's the secret to you being successful in your walk with Christ? He says, I run scared. Another way to say it is I'm on the alert. 
I'm sober-minded because I've got an adversary, the devil, who roams around seeking someone to devour. And I don't think because I've preached to massive amounts of folks and been in stadiums all around the world that I am not capable of messing up. I know exactly who it is. Guys who blow it in ministry, always, you can, you can almost track it, you know, um, they're, they're guys who become lazy in their personal relationship with God. They, they, they become focused on doing spiritual things, but not in being a spiritual person. In devoting themselves daily and meditating on God's word and being alone, away from crowds, away from human celebration, they also have a tendency, because they become a man of renown and folks want to spend time with them, they spend time with people who are fans, as opposed to brothers who rebuke and encourage them and challenge them, and also they're often approached by members of the opposite sex and maybe out of a desire to be compassionate towards them, they spend time with them and alone with them and boom, trouble comes. And uh, you see it, man, they grow lazy in a personal relationship, they begin counseling, spending time in isolation with individuals of the opposite sex or if they're same sex attracted with, with men of the same sex and they say, you know, I just didn't think it would happen to me. Can I just tell you guys something? I, I will not be surprised if it happens to me if I ever become lazy in my spiritual disciplines. If I ever start to spend time alone counseling a woman out of compassion. And if I ever think, it won't happen to me. You can almost bet it will. But I will to not sin. You won't hear me say, I will not sin. And man, so many of you guys come up and go, man, Wagner, I pray for you. And I just go, well, that explains it. Thank you. There but by the grace of God go I. I'm telling you something. One of the hardest things I've got to do is convince you that I've got to go to war to make my marriage a blessing. I've got to go to war so that I'm not an idiot and a tyrant as a daddy. I've got to go to war so I'm not swayed by public adoration and by the praise of men. I've got to go to war where I am next. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. A prudent man, the scripture says, sees evil and hides himself. Let me just say one thing. The glory of young men is their strength, but in Proverbs 20, 29, it says the honor of old men is their gray hair. In other words, they live around for a while and, and, and young men always think, I got this, I can take this on, I got it, man, here I go, watch me. And um, that's not good. Look, I tell guys all the time, if you are a wildebeest and you're hanging out with lions, you're not courageous, you're next. That's just the way it's gonna go, okay? And so man, if you sleep with the dogs, you're gonna wake up with fleas. Bad company corrupts good morals. You mess around, you're in trouble. Let me just tell you guys something. It is a fact that discretion is the better part of valor. That's what the scripture says. The prudent see evil and they hide themselves, but the naive go on and they are punished for it. Yeah, they don't play with snakes, all right? So this is one of those moments, don't try this at home. That was uh, when I was in India and I was, I should have been bitten right there in the face by that cobra and I wasn't. So they threw that up there just to go, okay, Wagner, practice what you preach. That was not my best moment. I predict if I do that again, I will have fang marks right here. Okay, here we go. But we hypnotized him and charmed him, right? Yeah, okay, all right. Not my best moment. All right, thank you. Here we go. Uh, there, are, there are no special cases. That's number five. There are no special cases. One of the things that I, I hear a lot from individuals is that they go, man, you don't understand my pain. I sometimes have people come up and go, hey, man, can I talk to you? I go, sure, what do you got? Well, come here, I need to talk to you alone, man. I mean, come over here. By, I just over here. Well, why? Well, because I, I don't know if you can handle this, or I don't know if you, you've never heard anything like this before. Can I just tell you something? You are unique. I mean, I, I know, you are unique. You have your own temptation. You've got your own family history. You've got your own uh, family of origin. You've got your own sin struggles that are intense. You are unique, just like everybody else. And this is what my Bible says, and it's true. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. One of the ways you're going to get in trouble is if you believe that you're a special case, that you're same-sex attraction, that you're addiction to pornography, that you're, um, that you're excessive dieting, that you're bulimia, that you're addiction to men, that the abuse that you suffered from as a child is so unique that, 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 that somehow there's some special parentheses of grace that you can do whatever you're going to do and surrender to it and God understands. 
Can I just tell you this? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Everybody feels what you feel. And God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also so that you might be able to endure it. But you gotta want it. And you gotta go get it. Be strong in the Lord, the scripture says, and in the strength of his might. The armor of God that we talked about last week is available to all of you. You've got to put it on. There are no special cases. Number six. There's no silver bullet. Now, this one's really important. Right? I I told you that, that Frankenstein, Dracula, what's the third one in the Trinity and the axis of evil? Werewolves. All right? Werewolves, all right, Dracula by a wooden stake. Frankenstein by dying to that which you thought would give you life and repenting because that was Victor Frankenstein's last words, kill the beast that I've created. It is ruinous to humankind. The enlightenment of man always is. The wooden stake is what kills the bloodlust. And what was that which took out a werewolf? Silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. One of the things that I hear way too often is that folks will tell you that the way you do spiritual warfare is you do what is called ex ballo. Uh, You cast out. So in Greek, okay, we get the word ballistics from the the word in Greek, ballo, B-A-L-L-O. That's where the word ballistic means. It means to throw. When you pull a gun, ballistics is the study and the science of what is thrown out of a barrel and how far it will go based on the shape of the barrel, the force, the number amount of gunpowder that is in there, and um, and, and the shape of, of the bullet itself, the cartridge. That's the study of ballistics, how far you throw it out. There is... An idea today that the way you go to war against Satan is by casting him out, ex ballo. You throw him out and you will be set free. No, you don't. Remember, there is a monolithic enemy. We sometimes say it is the deception of the enemy. Sometimes it is our flesh, which is a slave to the deception. Sometimes it is the course of this world. And there is no distinction or differentiation about how we go to war against any one of them. It's always trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You want to be victorious over sin? Don't go to some crazy place that's going to cast out demons and people convulse. There is no demon of lust to get rid of. There is lust in your flesh. Even if you get rid of the so-called demon of lust, your flesh is still corrupt and fallen. The Bible has no program to um, curb your flesh. You are to die to it and let Christ live. Therefore, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I must decrease, John the Baptist said, that he must increase. We are to yield to the Spirit. We are to continue to be controlled by the Spirit. And when I don't live according to my own understanding or follow my flesh, I walk in the way that is straight. There is no enemy that I am to cast out or bind. If you want to know where Satan is bound, listen to a real truth real quick. Can we bind Satan? Or just know this. Satan will be bound during the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation 20. Before that, he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if you think that you have killed him, you are just setting yourself up. And it's a problem. So there is no silver bullet, okay? Watch this. I'm going to read you from 2 Timothy 4, 4, 1 through 8. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teaches in accordance with their own desire. What's more attractive to you if I tell you, come over here to this powerful ministry that I've got where I will cast out demons from people and set you free from the bondage of the enemy or hey come over here with me and discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness come to this one time event and we will deliver you from the demon of boom or come over here and go to war with me and not entangle yourself in the affairs of everyday life in order that you might please the one who has enlisted you as a soldier 
Die to yourself continually, day by day. Or, hey, there's a big revival happening and the power of God will be known when we will once and forever bind Satan. Now, which one of those two gets you fired up? Man, give me the quick pill. It's just in, in your Bible. Nowhere from Romans to Revelation do you ever see the church told to cast out a demon. Well, Todd, what about what Jesus did? Well, aren't we supposed to WWJD? No, you're not. You're not Jesus. It's not what would Jesus do because you're not Jesus. How about what would Jesus have me do? All right, whatever that is, put that on your bracelet. All right? <laughs> and what Jesus would have you do is to walk with him and to trust him and to be sober-minded and delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Lastly, there is no sense in going at it alone. In other words, you, you are not made to do this alone, okay? My friend um, who is uh, in, in the Navy SEALs, the Navy SEALs have an expression, which is two is one and one is none. We just don't go by ourselves, right? We, guys, we all know Marcus Luttrell. They made a movie about him. What's the movie called? Lone Survivor. Well, guess what? Marcus didn't survive because he was alone. Marcus survived because people cared for him. Even a Navy SEAL. The mightiest warriors, they have the wisdom to know you don't go at this alone. If any man separates himself, he seeks his own desire, he quarrels against all sound wisdom. Let me just tell you something, man. If you're not a part of a church underneath godly leadership who doesn't lord it over you but serves you and cares for you and, and shepherds you and puts you in accountable community where they are gracious towards you and patience towards you and reprove you and exhort you with great patience and instruction. If you love Jesus so much you don't need anybody else, you don't love Jesus because you're not listening. If you're a serious follower of Christ and you're not deeply connected with a body, okay, you are seeking your own desire. A wildebeest that gets pushed out from the herd, it's the one that's eaten. There's no sense in going at this alone. It was not God's intention. When you get a member of the body of Christ and you take him away and put him over there, he is dismembered. It is a grotesque picture. When you get a sheep, away from the shepherd and the rest of the flock, he's called a meal. That's what they call a sheep who's over there by himself. Not a stud sheep. <laughs> There's no sense in going at it alone, man. We're called to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. God loves you and he wants you to be a part of a family. So come on, man, come on. Let me just give you one eighth one and I'll do this in a minute. Are you ready? Because I, if you're listening to me out there, some of you guys as believers, you've got to get this stuff correct. You've got to see why you're called to daily seek the king and to abide with him in community and to get rid of this false theology that's out there and start to learn what the Bible says. That's how you go to war against the unseen and how you live victorious in a way that people can see. There's something different about you. Who are you that you're not a slave to the prince of this world like I am? Answer, I'm a son of the king and I abide with him and he lives, and he lives in me. And I used to think he was bad and I had to manage my relationship with him. I used to run from him and avoid him and suppress his word and unrighteousness, but now I listen to him and he is kind and good and all his ways are peace. Preach that porch. Save the world around you, change your generation. But some of you guys are out there and you go, Todd, if you knew what I had done, if you knew that I was a Percy Shelley, and that there's a string of women that have committed suicide because they ran into me. If you knew I was a Mary Shelley who threw myself at the romantic poet one after another, if you knew the children that I killed because I ran with Percy Shelley, you wouldn't be telling me that I could be a child of the king. And can I just give you one last truth? Here it is. There is no such thing as a sinner so far gone that they are beyond the help of a loving, merciful Savior. I don't care how long you've been listening to deception. Tonight can be the night where you invite truth in, where you get on your knees and say, this is the truth. I have followed my flesh. I have been a part of the chorus of rebellion in the world. I have listened to the prince of this world who is a liar and a deceiver, and he has tortured me. I have tried to find life where there is no life, and tonight I repent. And God, if you can, if you can make me beautiful again, I am that monster that terrorizes people and you can make me beautiful? Who could do that? Answer, a compassionate, gracious, powerful, redemptive God who loves you. And I don't care how far gone you think you are, come home. 
be rescued and walk with him. Be a marvel to the world that you can walk against the current and the flood of rebellion. You can be free. You don't have to follow your flesh. You can be faithful. You can be a source of light and hope. You can be called out of darkness into his marvelous light, but you got to say, Lord, the blood of sin runs through me. I need a stake run through it. And I trust in the one that your son hung on. Set me free. Father, I pray for my friends that they would believe in the kindness of God, that they would see the beauty of your way. And they would be seen on this earth as you intend for your people to be seen, a city on a hill that can't be hidden, a light shining in the midst of darkness that declare your excellencies and the love of God and the kindness of God. Father, thank you that you have saved one like me who listened to the lies of the enemy and ran in the course of the ways of this world and, and listened to the demon of lust and anger and self-creation. And you saved me. And then for 30 years, Father, you've let me walk with you and it's been such a blessing. I thank you for grace. Let me be attentive to it. Lord, I pray that these seven truths would just ring strongly in the hearts of the redeemed. And I pray that that eighth one would tonight be a source of hope to those who have not been redeemed yet, that they would come if they're hurting and broken within. Lord, that you could make them whole again. I pray even for believers who have given themselves away this last week and, and who are, have been shocked that they go back to this place where they've acknowledged is death before, but they've gone back like a dog to their vomit. I pray that they would just go, oh Lord, I'm hurting too. I wanna pay attention to you this week again. I want to be seen as faithful because I'm gonna keep my eyes fixed on you. Father, would your grace just permeate this room? Would it change lives? Would somebody tonight come? Would they just come and be made new? We thank you for Christ. He died for our sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to you. Lord, may this song be someone's prayer. May they come. May they come.